building, taking those two buildings, I call them the old Elliott building, and that's the corner. Tearing those down, renovating, building something architecturally significant that blends in for a million dollars less than going out to Kmart. So I don't know why this study has been buried, why it's hidden, but there seems to be a dark, I'll call it dark, as a dark matter, no one knows what it is, out there in space somewhere. But there seems to be a mysterious force driving this, and I think it would be one of the worst decisions ever made in the history of Africa. Thank you. I urge you all to reject and to promote the courthouse state. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Thank you. Okay, that uh, concludes our public comments. Uh, the new business. Uh, call on uh, Dr. Cal from the uh, Virginia Department of Game and in Industries to give us a presentation. I think he wants a discussion. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I'm going to keep this pretty informal and try to keep it kind of an open discussion because I know that there are a lot of different opinions and decisions that can be made about dealing with urban deer issues. Well, I'll first just briefly give some general information because some people may not be aware. I live, breathe, and die cervids. That's my specialty. So I kind of take some of this stuff for granted and I'll try to provide some general information. Um, I'll start with an unhunted deer population or animals that don't get harvested out of the population can more than double in a single year. If you think that an average white-tailed doe can produce two to three fawns a year given uh, the general body condition and the nutrition that's available to her, that can happen for eight to twelve years depending on how long she lives, again given her body condition and um, the nutrition that's available to her. If you look around Abingdon, I'll, I'll tell you that the nutrition level here in the town and out the outskirts of town is significant. Very good nutrition. That's why the deer are here. So you're talking about the average doe that was here four or five years ago now has 24 fawns that are her progeny. Uh, the second thing I'll say is that we understand very little about deer vehicle collisions especially here in Virginia, we estimate that the average nine out of 10 deer vehicle collisions go unreported completely. And that is due to various situations, whether the person doesn't have insurance, whether they quickly look over the car and feels like the damage is not uh, significant enough to cause them to need insurance, uh, which sometimes changes once you get home and you find out you have a radiator leak or something or that they're, for various reasons they don't have a driver's license or something like that. But nine out of 10 deer vehicle collisions go unreported. And the third thing I'll, I'll talk about is, is that deer that are around people in unhunted situations or areas without pressure become very habituated. And I'll relay a story and I won't use any names because I don't know if these people would permit me to other than just tell the story that around Easter, um, a, a family in the town had their grandchildren over and a deer came up knocked over one of the grandchildren to take the Twinkie or the little tasty treat that the child was eating. It's because the deer became so habituated to humans that it understood humans as food not as a threat and that can become very dangerous when you have an animal who's protective of food and their fawns getting close proximity with people, especially young children, who don't know how to defend themselves. The second anecdotal evidence, or just story that I'll tell you, is that very recently I was contacted about a deer that was hit on the road somewhere in the town, made it a few hundred yards. This happens frequently. The deer gets hit, and whether you're going slow or fast, they make it a few hundred yards off the road. They lay down to lick their wounds and end up expiring because deer don't have vets. So even a small broken rib can puncture a lung and cause that deer to bleed out and then they expire. Well, this happened uh, just north of Court Street and the deer died in someone's yard. They had nothing to do with it and it stunk up their whole neighborhood. And there's nothing that we as an agency can do about that. So there, the landowner is now stuck with this animal that they have nothing to do with. And this is, these are just two stories that I've been involved with here. I'm not the local deer biologist in this region. 
I'm a surrogate biologist, but I take care of certain stories in Abingdon or things that come into Abingdon just because I live here and I'm happy to help out where I can. Bill Bassinger is your local district biologist and he can tell you a litany more stories than I could even think about right now. So harvest is one option for controlling deer populations. It's the option that we as an agency recommend the most. It's ethical, it's humane, it's quick, and we ensure, it basically ensures that the animal that expires gets used. Hunters eat the meat. Uh, animals that are dispatched under a kill permit or under some of these other situations that I will discuss end up going into dead holes or get just buried somewhere on the property. Currently, there is one legal way to harvest deer in the town limits of Abingdon, and that's with a pneumatic weapon, uh, which is an air rifle, basically. So there are, there are now air rifles, and I can't believe it myself sometimes, but there are air rifles that are 35 caliber and bigger, 35, 45, 55 caliber. So we're talking about a muzzle loader sized bullet, but it's projected with air. So it's technically legal to use in the town, but you just have to have, make sure that it's of a certain size caliber that it abides by our regulations. So there, there's a gun out there called the Bulldog, and it's a super compact, high pressure air that can fire a 35 caliber bullet, dead accurate at 75 yards. Unfortunately, after discussing this with my wife, she, she exited the idea because it costs like $1,200 just, for for, just for the gun, let alone all the accessories. So this is, this is kind of a, a, a rich man's toy, if I, if I could put it that way. Or the children of Twinkies standing by the gun. Yeah, exactly. So this is, this is an option currently, today. However, it needs to be used in accordance with our regulations, which would be normal deer season under the current rank firearms, because it is considered a firearm according to DGIF. Um, it needs to be used during firearm season, which in uh, what doesn't start until November, I believe, this year. So that's one legal option. Uh, the thing that prohibits other options currently is the town ordinance section 50.7, which prohibits any kind of projectile that may cause human harm from being used other than pneumatic weapons. There is an exception there about pneumatic weapons, which goes back to suggestion number one. Now, allowing regulated hunting would open that up to urban archery, or not urban archery as what we have as a, an agency, but just people in town using archery on their own property. Um, there are a whole bunch of different ways that other towns that have had similar situations have enrolled in urban archery programs to extend their archery seasons to enhance the opportunities associated with archery but currently an amendment to 50.7 would allow average hunter during archery season to use archery equipment without having to enroll in urban archery or any of the other programs that we have so that's how hunting can be used uh, the second option is that the town would need to apply for uh, deer or DCAP permits. Basically, that's we call those deer controlled assistant permits, DCAP. This is a uh, these are permits given to an entity and allows antlerless deer to be harvested. And since the antlerless deer are the progeny creators, those are the ones that need to be removed from the population. Um, those are provided to an entity, but the town would need to provide the people to actually harvest the animals. And then the town, or the people who actually harvest the animals, would need to find a way to remove the carcass from the landscape. Because you could shoot a deer on public property, but you need to get it off there so it doesn't stink, and we don't end up with a situation like I talked about earlier. The third option, which it, um, has been used before with great success, is to hire professional sharpshooters, people who have specific licenses and are regulated by the state to shoot weapons, firearms, in highly urbanized area with extreme pinpoint accuracy and remove the animals themselves. <coughs> However, that costs a lot of money. Urban archery, or using hunters, gets rid of the, generally gets rid of the deer issue, almost always gets rid of the deer carcasses because hunters use the animal. The other two options do neither of those things. And they cost the town money. 
whether you use professional police to, to use DCAP permits, you have to pay for police time. You have to pay for police to find some place to get rid of the carcasses. Archers, hunters, do that for you, and they do it for free. Um, the last thing I'll talk about is that archery has statistically been proven time and time again to be safer than most kids' sports. Softball, baseball, especially football, and even uh, volleyball can be cause more harm to people than archery. Generally, the people who get harmed in archery are those who do not follow rules and do not follow safety procedures and end up falling out of their own tree stand because they didn't flip in. So those are the main options that I wanted to present to you. How, there's a whole bunch of other options, and I don't know if anybody's interested in discussing them. I'm not going to discuss them specifically unless you bring them up because there are issues with a lot of them. And I will start by just giving you an example. We don't even discuss sterilization of deer, especially in the state of Virginia, because it doesn't work. If you think, I would, I would urge you to uh, Google deer in Staten Island. Currently, Staten Island has paid roughly $4 million over the last three years to try and sterilize the deer on an island. They just signed another five-year contract because they've only reduced the population about 20%. Staten Island is not very big. Abingdon is not an island. You start sterilizing deer in here, you're just going to have more deer coming in. It doesn't work. So I'm happy to discuss the ins and outs of that or any other option that you'd like to discuss. But I, I was kind of hoping that you'd have some questions for me about this and, and some of your own thoughts. But um, this is Court Street. This is me driving down Court Street after our last discussion. You, it's hard to see because it's black and white. My printer ran out of ink. But this is me driving down Court Street here, and there's a doe right there that she almost got hit. I mean, within feet. She, she stopped there as I turned around and just waited for me to come back around and take a picture of her as she crossed Court Street. This is, this is not a, um, and that's just between the last time we spoke, which was me coming in for three minutes, and today. Does anybody have any questions? I have a question, if you don't mind. Yes, um, ma'am. What about extending the hunting season in November um, for the deer, and extending it, and I know you probably have to go through legislation, but can that be done? Instead of doing it in, in the, um, in the spring and the summer months, because can you looked into that? So currently, currently hunting is not allowed in the town. Right. So. But out on the outskirts. Too. Oh well, the, the there currently is hunting on. It's very much open in Washington County. It's probably one of our most liberal deer harvest counties in, especially in Southwest Virginia. Um, but the problem is, deer learn very quickly that this is a safe place. There are 4,481 properties in the town of Abingdon, and some of, some of them, 50 or more of them, are greater than 10 acres. You're talking about a lot of very safe place. When they find a safe place, they'll come in there and they'll stay there. So the option to open up hunting around that is that may actually only encourage deer to come into Abingdon versus remove from Abingdon. So Does that make sense? sense? There's no other remedies except like um, bear cat urine or wild animal urine that, that homeowners can put in their yards or any any type. There, thing? there, are, there are type. There are things that individual property owners can do to protect some of their property. At sometimes, things along that line, sprays, scents, they work for a week until it rains. Then it washes away, and then the homeowner needs to go back out and spray. If you're talking about somebody who gardens it on a one acre parcel, to spray one acre again costs a significant amount of money. Um, there are a lot of things that you can put up to scare deer away for a very short period of time, but they, again, are smart. They become habituated. They learn very quickly that I can get close to this thing and it doesn't hurt me, therefore I can just walk by it. Dogs. Dogs will scare deer off for a short period of time until the, the deer realizes exactly how far that dog can go on a lead, and you'll see them walk right next to where that dog is soft. Or walk right along the outskirts of fencing. So the removing deer from the town, if the town council feels that it's important, there, there are limited options for removing deer. Other, other than do nothing. Do nothing is an option still. That you, you put the 
responsibility on each homeowner who's having issues with the earth. So again, there are, there are limited options to homeowner has as well. Especially if you have deer damage and deer problems on your property, but your next door neighbor does nothing about it. Now you've created a sub-sanctuary where the deer just moves over here where he's safe, comes on your property at night, does his damage, eats the food, and then moves back. Well, um, somebody else asked me, another citizen asked me about relocation, but they just come back. Absolutely not. Um, there, are, there are an insurmountable amount of red paperwork, red tape that goes into moving service. Um, Depends on do you, do you have, I mean, it is, it's a very, very expensive option as well. I mean, it's probably right up there with sterilizing deer. The amount of time you'd have, the amount of staff that you'd have to actually tranquilize these animals, put them on the trailers, find a place to move them. And at this point, we have nowhere else to move them. There are plenty of deer throughout the entire state of Virginia, and nobody outside of Virginia is going to take deer from Virginia. Can you tell us what you would recommend? Absolutely. Okay. So, speaking as somebody from DGIF and speaking personally, mm -hmm. I think the best option is to allow hunters to use archery equipment inside the town limits. You can. There are a lot of different regulations that the town can put on that. Except you can't make money off it because you have because everybody who uses archery equipment has to buy a license through us. They have to be licensed, and they have to take a hunter education course before they can buy a license. So they have to learn about being safe. Archery equipment can be used very effectively without your neighbor even knowing, and can harvest animals. And can it doesn't even take harvesting all the animals. It takes putting pressure on these animals for them to realize, you know, John's property is not safe. Because we ran in there with seven, we only came out with six. And they will learn that that's not a safe area, and they will stay out of it. So archery can be done in several different ways. The first way I mentioned is that just change 50.7 so that archery tackle can be used in the town. And then during archery season, which starts October 5th this year, hunters can go out on properties that they have permission to use of their own property and harvest animals. If you feel that urban archery is appropriate, urban archery extends that season to earlier in September and extends it later but at this point, I'm not sure that that's needed. I mean, you haven't had deer harvested in the town of Abingdon in years. So my suggestion will be to take small steps. Allow some deer to be harvested at certain, at, during the normal archery season and see how it goes. If it puts pressure on the deer and it's working effectively in certain areas, maybe expand it to urban archery in other areas. And you say they do that for free, right? Hunters? Yes. Absolutely. And they use the meat? Absolutely. If I could cover up, if I could tell you as, as David Kell, who lives at Panorama Drive, not as a DJF agent, I would love to harvest deer. Yeah. And I would, I take them all home and I, I butcher them myself and I feed my family with that. Yeah. I mean, as an agency as well, we say that it's the most effective, most uh, financial, fiscally responsible option that you have provided. It's, it's safe as well. Would there have to be an agreement between the hunters and the landowners to use their property? Absolutely, and that, and that goes without saying with any, any property anywhere in the state. If you want to hunt uh, five acres or you want to hunt 5,000 acres, you need to ask permission to use that property. Yeah, you cannot just trespass the hunt. If Whitley wants to come across the street and hunt in my yard, then she's going to have to have our permission with it. Absolutely. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Does the owner have any liability for allowing that to happen in case of so you can there we have uh, we have waiver forms on our on our website you can download and sign and sign away the the your right to sue somebody if you get hurt so that's so that you would um, download this and take it and say can I hunt on your property here's a waiver form that you know releases you of any liability if I get hurt and then you you both sign it and get permission to to do that or you could just you know a lot most of the time. Places that I hunt, the places that my friends hunt, generally it's just a gentleman's agreement. Hey, listen, I, I want to hunt here. Can I? And if I'm disrespectful or I don't treat your property right, then they get kicked off. It, it goes. Ninety-nine percent of hunters are very ethical, very effective. It's the one person that that gives hunting a bad name. The one rotten apple in a barrel that can ruin the whole bunch for sure. I'm basically stupid about deer. Um, <laughs> 
I thought they like to live in the woods and eat nuts and berries and stuff like that. What what is the why do they want to be in Abingdon? I mean, you know, they got all these woods and mountains. And stuff. Well, deer deer like ecotones, which is the transition. Like what? Ecotones. That's a fancy way of saying the transition between woods and pasture. They like the area where they can get acorns in the fall, and they like the areas where they can get forbs and and uh, succulents spring. in the spring. And Abingdon is full of succulents. Yeah. I plant them around my house. I've had deer walk through and come into my garden because I've planted the whole thing with delicious food, which I wanted to feed my family with, yeah, but I ended up feeding the deer with. I'm Great. assuming since, go ahead. Are there any other towns in the cities around near us that are doing this? Absolutely. Uh, the, so there are currently 51 cities and townships enrolled in urban archery, and that is just the urban archery program. That doesn't talk about just general archery season during, during the standard DGIF allowed seasons. Uh, the closest one is Saltville, um, Lebanon is now in it, Blacksburg, Lynchburg. In fact, Lynchburg has such a deer issue that they now do urban archery, allowing hunters to come in and take as many deer as they want during September through February, and then they have sharpshooters come in from after that, on top of that, to still remove deer year-round. So they've, they've, they've found a lot of success with doing uh, urban archery, but just didn't get as many deer removed as they wanted to. I'm assuming since you didn't list this as an option, that DGIF doesn't have any program that it physically does anything to remove or absolutely thin deer. We we uh, we provide the licenses to hunters. That's, that's what we do. I have a question. You might say this earlier, but they can't do this hunting on public right away or public ground. It's only on private property. So the uh, property that would be public depends on the public ground. For example, you can't hunt on VDOT property, but you can but hunt, they on hunt on Valley Street. Like if it's a, it's a public road, could, they, could there be So hunting? you can't you can't hunt on roads. Okay, well, that's what I was asking. Okay, I just want to make sure. It only has to be on, pro has to be on it's a, it's private property. Right? No, private property and then public property where there's a safety uh, like a Right, right, I understand. Like, like, like a preserve or whatever. Right. So okay. the, I just meant like uh, Department of Forestry or U.S. Forest Service, you can hunt on those right, properties. Right, They're public. Okay. Uh, it all depends on the, the public piece of property, and the owner of that property would need to make specific decisions about that piece of property. For example, um, DCR has certain parks where they allow hunting, and they have certain pieces of property, certain preserves where they don't allow hunting. It's the same ownership, they just, just delineate which ones they want pu public hunters to and they can control that. So. Or do you give us the list of hunters? Or do you put us in common? No? Yep. Okay. So this is, this is kind of, um, <coughs> so urban archery uh -huh. would, uh, for example, I'll use Lebanon for example. Um, the town of Lebanon just recently joined the urban archery program. And they have, I think this is it. So, during the urban archery season, bow and archery tackle is the only permitted tackle to be used to take, to take deer. It's allowed in their legal definition of what's um, a projectile that can be fired. Hunter shall possess a valid Virginia hunting license and archery license. And then the owners of the property that hunting is going to be used on has to provide the chief of police or the designee with the following information copy of the tax map that's being hunted, the name and address and telephone number of any hunters used like utilizing the property, and certification from of the property ownership. So basically you show them your lease or your deed that you purchased that property, you give them a list of names who are going to hunt that property, and a, a tax map showing them the boundaries of the property. And then uh, hunting is prohibited within 100 yards of any uh, school or resident property. So it's a safety zone basically. Any any occupied structure, you can't hunt within 100 yards of it. But that 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 is what that's what Lebanon chose to do. That is not a state law. Did that's you said they had a specific type of bow you have to use or archery or equipment? Just, just any archery. Equipment. Yep. So in Virginia, that goes everything from recurve, traditional bows, all the way up to compound to crossbows. Those are all considered legal archery tackle in the state of Virginia. Gotcha. I've got a couple more questions. Yes, what, if, what if um, 
the Twinkie thief gets killed by the, or attempted to be killed by an archer, um, and they hit it, but it doesn't die, and it ends up going to the next door neighbor's house, and the kid walks out and sees a dead deer, or a halfway suffering deer. What, you know, what are you gonna do about that? What happens? Well, generally, the hunter who harvested, or tried to harvest that animal, is going to continue to follow up on that animal. Well, what if they can't find it, but then it's like it leaves and goes away, and then they wind up somewhere else down the Ends up in their backyard by the last week. Another Twinkie <laughs> kid or something. But so they're, they're, it's, a, it's an unfortunate circumstance that even the best gunshot with a, a huge bullet can hit a deer and not kill the animal lethally immediately. Mm -hmm. uh, you follow a blood trail, you try and get up on it. Archery hunters are probably some of the most accurate hunters in the world out there. It takes a long time to practice to get good at using a bow and arrow. Now if we, we get calls we get calls every couple of years about a deer that has been injured by some hunter during at some point and is wandering around in somebody's neighborhood and as an agency we don't like that we we don't like to see that animal suffer. We can respond to that and go out and dispatch that animal and remove it. But we don't just do that for every deer that's wandering around through somebody's neighborhood. We're talking about a deer that was injured in an effective way that it can't survive. Well, how about, I was just going to ask the council a little question about if there's another deer nursing a baby and it gets killed, do you feel bad about that? You know, do y'all feel bad about that? Well, I, I guess I told y'all my story. Somebody hit a deer in front of my house last week or it was the week before. I don't know, but it decided to come into my yard and die. Well, sort of die, but <coughs> long story short, I had to call. Yeah, it did. Laid up against my fence. All the golfers were poking at it when they came through. Aww. And it is very sad. I mean, it really is. It's but I, I was on my way to work, so I had to call um, animal control, and they did send out deputies to, to dispatch of the animal, and they, you know, but that... So, so what is the hunt, call? So hunting season does not happen when animals are, are weaning. They're, they're young. So no, deer not weaning, but they're nursing. Yeah, uh, nursing, weaning, nursing and weaning. So that May is when fawns are born, and they're generally weaned within 100 days. So they're generally eating their own food. They look like adults by September, October. But I thought there was like you could have a couple of deer in one season. To oh, they're all they're twins and triplets. Okay. You're talking about one doe having three babies so all at the same time. Okay, so they just have one. Yeah, hunting is not open when they're three babies per yeah. year. In September, they're, they're they, weaning. Well, no, by September, they're, they're adults. I mean, they have lost their baby spotted coat, and they're eating adult forage. Just that back yeah. so, so May is when fawns are born, and it takes 100 days for a, a fawn to be weaned. Have these, uh, are you aware of... Uh, there's some organization, and I don't know whether it's some organization or everything, but there's some group of people that don't think that you should kill animals. Uh, how do you deal with that issue? Uh, is there organizations like that around here that you're aware of? I mean, so I think with the agency you're referencing is PETA. Yeah, I think that's PETA. What I'm yeah, so I mean, there are. Uh, I don't know where those those groups are located. I, I'm assuming that there are probably members of PETA in the town of Abingdon. Oh, that's a national organization. Yes, yes, sir. Yeah, local yes, local sir. Okay. So I don't know. I don't know. I think their headquarters is lo located in Washington D.C. Okay. Uh, they're a major lobbying group. I, I, I don't know how they. But we get calls by them, I'm sure. And we, is, is there a refuge for deer if they get hurt or injured <coughs> that that we could? That they can be taken to to help them recover. Absolutely, there are there are several different uh, rehabilitators. Yeah. Um, Where they, are they? I don't. You don't know. Uh, I can give you names, but you know we have a whole list of names on our website. If you find an, an, any kind of animal, any kind of yeah. wildlife, we encourage people to either try to call a rehabilitator, call us to see if we have staff that can assist with you. For example, if we get a a bald eagle that gets hit by hit hits a window. Mm -hmm. well, that's, we like to take care of that if we it all can, and that includes our law enforcement staff, that includes our biology staff, anybody that can get out there and assist 
getting that to a rehabilitator. We try to do that. So like a police officer would, you know, would try to get a hold of a rehabilitator before they would take one. They could, yeah. yeah. I mean, it depends on the injury. We have a lot of contact with police officers, even town officers. For example, when we have um, deer that are struck on the highway or barrier that are struck on the highway. We sometimes our, our, our fastest means of responding to that is called the local sheriff or called the local state police. And they can go out and they have the authority to dispatch that animal. And then if it's in the right of way, VDOT will take it away. And if it's someplace where we need to assist them, we're always happy to assist with that. Um, we have our own staff that can do that, but you know it, it's an unfortunate thing that happens, but it, it does not happen very frequently that animals get wounded in the act of hunting and don't ever get recovered. I mean, the, not, like I said, 99% of hunters, when they wound an animal, feel horrible about the fact that they actually wounded that animal and were not able to recover if it happens. I mean, I would, as a personal hunter, I would track a deer for two days before I gave up on that animal. The countervailing issue, I guess, is that people are going to run over them and will have the same problem. But like in my house. Yeah. Right. The, the average the average deer vehicle collision cost the, the car owner about three thousand dollars. Cindy, you should dedicate your property as a deer rescue. Well, I want to try. It's <laughs> gonna work. Okay, Council, we've got a long agenda. Let's wrap it up. You have you have any more questions for Dr. Kale? Dr. Kale, thank you very much. It's thank been you, very sir. informative to us, and uh, we'll decide. Uh, Absolutely. If there's any other questions that come up in the meantime, or you'd like me to talk about anything else, don't hesitate to call or email. Thank you. Do you have Thank you. Okay, Council. Yeah, so what do you want to do with do. this? Uh, um, I could send you a list. I, I can't give it to you. It's on my deer sheet. Send it to your picture. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Council, what do you all want to do with this? Well, I think we've our, got to consider it. I'd like to have our staff investigate yeah. uh, the other towns and entities around us who are doing this and come up with some ideas for us on how to effectively control deer. I know they're pets, you know, and they're beautiful animals also, but uh, I, I think it's the population is overburdening the town. Mm -hmm. uh, that'll take a while. Uh, I suggest we uh, put this on the October work session. Is that okay with yeah. everybody? Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you again, Dr. Kelly. Thank you. Okay. Next item is uh, discussing discussion regarding Planning Commission proposed amendment to historic district entrance card of overlay district. Mr. Boswell. Thank you, Mayor Craig. Hello, Council. Um, the uh, July Planning Commission meeting, uh, Planning Commission asked that uh, staff present the two drafts that we've come up with uh, concerning the amendment to the Historic District Entrance Corridor Overlay District. You should have those in front of you. Uh, one will have be highlighted at the top, uh, it says adding zoning warrants, so be highlighted on it. That is the uh, draft that does not contain the design guidelines as part of the ordinance. The consensus of the Planning Commission uh, is that right now they would like to see the guidelines as a separate document rather than add them to the ordinance and they're looking for feedback from the town council before they make a decision at the upcoming August 26 Planning Commission meeting. Good. We're missing the map for the, uh, the, the historic district overlay. There's no map that we could ever find. Is that correct? There is no. There is yeah. no map. Okay, so we need a map. We we, we, really we actually agree on that. Um, I mean, that's something that we could we could do instead of, and that could be one feedback we give to the planning commission or you give to the planning commission. Um, on is that instead of identifying what well, one thing we have done in the ordinance is is identify the streets based on the statute. Um, about it being arterial roads only, but we do agree. I think it's very difficult, especially when roads change, names change, uh, where you have a, a significant amount of frontage. I mean, what's your thought on that, Al? I mean, should we do a map as opposed to identifying the streets? Can we do both? Yeah, I, I think both would be a good idea. 
Well, I think um, you need to do one or the other. I don't know if you because. Well, it's yeah. misinterpreted. Well, I guess you're right. You probably would be safe to, mm -hmm. to maybe I, have I, both. I think it's safe to have both. Yeah. Because the, 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 the intent of the map is the ordinance and then have, have an actual. Yeah. I, would question, I would question why a couple of these are in there. Like Jonesboro Road has no connection with the historic district. Fourfield Highway has no connection with the historic district. Well, Some of the others do. Most of them. Well, what we did was we just eliminated ones that were not arterial roads. Okay. It's further, if, if, if that's the discussion where it takes us, I think we might have even discussed that briefly, or maybe it was staff did, or at the planning did, commission, whether or not we should go further with that. And that's all up to you. There are, two, there are two requirements. It has to be an arterial road and it has to lead to the historic district or a historic property. And yeah. Well, there's, there's so point, I, I guess it te technically re leads there after several miles. <laughs> yeah, it could be hard to leads to something that leads to the historic district, mm -hmm. but, they don't, mm -hmm. but they don't connect to the historic district directly, mm -hmm. but they are too. Mm -hmm. So I, I would eliminate those. Which one's John's Joe? Jones Burn, Portland Highway. Jones Burn Road, Portland Highway. Portland Highway. I think the. Just go talking. Sorry, yeah, right. um, and Jason and I have talked about this at length, and, and Jimmy too. That, some places have a huge booklet of, a, of guidelines um, and they say very specifically and have pictures of buildings that are allowed and when we say this kind of building this is the picture of what we're talking about and we don't mean this building. Um, other places are like we are now. They have a very general ordinance, no guideline at all. And I think... Well the guidelines, there's some guidelines but they're subject, subject, subjective they're, and they yeah. have a lot of Right. Lexington's uh, guidelines okay. exactly mirror what ours are. It's very hard. It's subjective. Right. Well, can you tell me how all of these roads got put in there? I have no idea. Yeah. Yeah, how can you? I can lay your side. Did you do it, Al? Yeah. Like, I think you said yeah. It was a team effort. Come on. <laughs> Well, I was pushed into it. <laughs> you were pushed into it. So, <laughs> kicking and screaming. I, I exactly think generally they listed all the roads that they could think of yeah. that they could regulate. That's okay. how they got there. Not it's called a pick and choose ordinance. <laughs> without consideration of what the statute says and allowed to do. But where I was going is I, I, I don't think that we need to have a book as thick as what Derek has in front right. of them right. as guidelines. Yeah. I, I do think that staff would be better off with something that they could go by objectively so when we get applicants they can say well this is what we do uh, without being that specific but I also think that the ordinance needs to have some specificity I don't think it needs to be overly specific but I think it needs more than what it has now so we can point both to the ordinance um, which is a little bit more specific than it is now and have a guidebook that staff can use so they fit together I'd like to review just for a minute with the council, and, and you help me with my memory block. My memory is not very much good, but I believe we started this procedure because uh, we had a situation with a certain business who got approved at one location and submitted basically the same thing and, and did not get approved and didn't get <coughs> Real, as I understand it, I uh, didn't get really good guidance as to what they needed to do to, be, to uh, improve their situation. Uh, I think, so I think our objective in, if I'm right, uh, our objective in referring this to the Planning Commission for a recommendation on changing the limits was to get some consistency in the process so that and to be business friendly so when somebody comes in and they talk to Jason about what they need to do uh, what their building needs to look like that they get good guidance and if he recommends it basically it's probably the planning commission's going to approve it if they if they decide not to follow his advice uh, and submit something else then it'll be up to the planning commission and they can determine that uh, I think that's what we were kind of shooting for. Uh, what do we need to do? What are you all asking us to do to accomplish that objective? I think the planning commission was just looking for some feedback from you all to see if you like the drafts that have been proposed and if the 
again, like you were saying, Mayor Craig, take some of the restriction out. Um, I think by being a little bit more specific, um, it gives staff a better opportunity to speak with the okay. Congress. So do you feel good about what you've done here? I do feel good. Okay. Yes, you're okay with it? What, I, I like Al's idea. I think we should uh, eliminate some of these. I think some of the reason we had some inconsistency is that some planning commissions, are, and I sit on the planning commission, and we were inconsistent too, uh, to tell you the truth. Uh, uh, I think we need to narrow it down. I don't. I agree with Al. I don't see why Russell Road and Jonesboro Road is in there. Those three that you said, or was it just two? Just two. Porterfield. Oh, Jones or Porterfield. I don't think you put a Russell Road on. Okay. Does everybody agree that? You, well, okay. I'd like to. If All I right, could, may I? I? I see a few advantages to take these roads out, but I'd like to be a lot more educated as to why they need to be taken out because they are. Um, they are arterial roads, right? Mm -hmm. We designate them. They don't lead to the historic, yeah, historic district. Not. Main, there are two left turn roads road. that, that yeah. uh, off of Main Street and to, onto uh, Russell Road or, or onto Porterfield Highway. That means there's a take of a lot more traffic. It doesn't enter the historic district okay. than, than enters the historic district. So Porterfield doesn't even come close to our downtown yeah. historic district. For instance, West Main Street uh, is listed here as going from the historic district to the corporate lists. Why that far? Why, why not stop it at, at Route 19 for Porterville Highway? Right. Okay. I, that, that's right. where that I was another thing I was going to say. Before you have East Main and West Main. Yeah. yeah. We, I mean, that, another reason I think for having the map. Yeah. Is, yeah. is, have, is yeah. having the map official. The same thing with East Main Street. It goes from the historic district to the Portland Lewis. Why that far? You could stop it at uh, Thompson Drive where the, it goes up to the high school. Um, and, and thereby. Uh, limit the planning commissions involved with all these things. I like that idea too. Mm -hmm. Makes sense to streamline. Uh, what you said. Another thing is, to talk, to talk, to talk. You know, we just we just got this dropped on us right now, and um, I'm sorry to say I missed the last planning commission, meeting, but so we've got a reference here to to guidelines, right? So, but we don't have guidelines. Are we going to see guidelines? Well, it, it is in there. I'm it's sorry. The I apologize. The, there's the one that I gave you that's uh, highlighted is the one that doesn't. It should have a separate set of guidelines with it, but Which, I have I forgot to one? print that off. So, um, highlighted it's in this it's design all, guidelines. This, this is one has it within the ordinance. That one. This is the one that has. This would be. This would be. It would be the same set of guidelines, just in separate documents. Thank you. Read this. It's good. It's going back to planning commission. We're sending this back to planning commission after we get feedback from the town council. As far as the guidelines go, uh, this is just my opinion. I think that anything we need uh, to give guidance on, we should put in the ordinance at this time and and have some experience with the ordinance and if there are if it's necessary to add other guidelines allow uh, make it clear that the planning commission is free to do it that be my I, I, I think the ordinance should reference guidelines but the guidelines should be kept separate so that when you when you change your opinion about paint colors you don't have to go back and re reenact the whole zoning ordinance um, <coughs> but i don't think the guidelines in the ordinance will be that specific well, well, we did have a few references of. You, you don't have to reinvent the wheel yeah. every time you change your opinion. But yeah. roof, roof, roof but I think that might have been part of the problem is that there was some. Inc inc it's it's kind of like a double edged sword. We don't want the inconsistencies, but if we make it easier for the planning commission to deviate by having their own set of guidelines and then being able to waive it, that leads to some of the inconsistencies. I'm just trying to play devil's advocate. Right. And yeah. At the same time, if we're going to approve. A reference to guidelines. I'd like to see what those guidelines are, along with the ordinance, so we can so we can see it all. I think that's what that, that is what it is. The guidelines are in. Yeah. That was the the, the comprehensive list of the guidelines that are included in the one that you're looking at, where it says design guidelines. Right. That would be a. I've got one that's highlighted and one that's not. Yes, sir. And which one is which? So right. essentially, this one right here, where it starts on this one, this one um, that you had right here. 
the guidelines are contained within the ordinance, and this is what we decided at the Planning Commission meeting. Yeah, These just, are the design guidelines. I just failed would to be print the off the guidelines and add it to that yeah. sheet. Right. So the Planning Commission wants to keep the guidelines in the ordinance? Well, well it seemed as if the consensus was the, the Planning Commission wanted to have a separate set of guidelines. But that's why, but when we discussed it, we said, well, there wasn't a clear consensus, so we would get some feedback from the town council to maybe get some further direction. The planning commission could get some further direction. Um, and that's why we're having this discussion. I know that Mr. Bradley prefers having a separate set of guidelines. Um, and that's what we can discuss, whether or not that's appropriate. But the mayor is saying that yeah, maybe sure. we give it a, a period of time where we see what it looks like in the code with those specific guidelines which are a little bit more specific than what we had before, and then reevaluate it in a year or whatever to determine if we need to have a separate document. But did I uh, summarize that appropriately? Okay. Yeah. 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 I, I didn't hear what you all were saying. I said he's the one with the experience, you know, Mr. Bradley. So I, I prefer to keep the guidelines out of the ordinance, but have the guidelines to see when we talk about the ordinance. And I think the benefit to what Mr. Bradley is trying to say, and again, it's not my, up to me, uh, ultimately you all, um, is that you can reference the, the guidelines, and if you were to make a change or deviate from those guidelines, I think we have in here that would take a six to one vote or even a split. Does it really make any difference if? As long as the guidelines have to come back to us before we change it, does it really matter? Well, I, I think if the Planning Commission adopts their own separate guidelines, I don't know if that's coming back to the Council. And that's, are you, am I correct, Cam? Yeah, so the difference with the version that we have the guidelines of the ordinance is in the ordinance, and they have to be followed. If we go the route of keeping those guidelines separate, they're probably still going to be done in the spirit of the intent of the ordinance, but there could be allowed to be promulgated separately by the Planning Commission. So what's your recommendation? My recommendation? You're going to put me on the spot? I think my opinion is we keep it in the ordinance, like the mayor says, to start. Um, to keep the guidelines in the ordinance so we do have some consistency, and then later on determine um, whether or not we have to have a separate set of guidelines. That's just my opinion. But I also would defer to the Planning Commission and the Council. This is one I don't think is it. Zoning in my opinion, is a little bit more sacred than how, what you're doing with a roof or what the Historic Preservation District is doing, what kind of shingles they're putting on and things of that nature. I just, I, this is my personal opinion, when you start getting into land use and zoning, I've never seen, I don't see it that often where a zoning ordinance allows an unelected body to start deviating from the zoning ordinance, which is essentially what we're allowed to be allowing to do. That's just my opinion. Um, but it doesn't mean it's not legal or it can't be done. Uh, I just, it's, I, I'm not familiar with that. Just having an experience with it. I mean, I think, and would the planning commission be doing the guidelines or would you be doing the guidelines? No, we'll be doing the guidelines. We'll be planning okay. commission would or, or staff would. No, staff. Right. We're, this is, these are the guidelines that we need to be. He's talking about if there was a separate set of guidelines, okay? Staff can't adopt those. Somebody has to adopt those because someone with an authority to adopt those. And that's what that's what the, the separate guidelines are. They're the same exact guidelines. I, I understand, understand that, but I think Al is saying we, we want to have a more detailed list of guidelines. That's, that's essentially how the, how yes. the historic district is. Correct. He wants so. to do it like a book, totally separate from that, and then add to those okay. guidelines. Okay. So if the Historic Preservation like Board wants to add guidelines to there, they have the authority to do that. You see where I'm going? It's almost like bylaws. Right. And that's what he's asking to do. Okay, as I'm opposed confused. to Okay, that's okay. As opposed I mean, to putting I, it in the zoning. And, and I think the difference would be between what you have proposed here in the ordinance of, for instance, windows should be used to provide interest, interest and surface variations on building elevations. It would say you can use these types of windows would be what would be in a separate guideline book. Right? And I'm gonna have pictures of wood frame windows and whatever other kinds of windows that there are. Yeah, I, 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 that with an overlay yeah, I really don't one. feel that we want to get into the weeds. Okay. Okay. For an overlay time. district, yeah, for an well, I really think we're... Okay. I understand the intent. I, I understand the historic, historic That's just my opinion. 
But I mean, if, if, if we're going to go through the same, we're almost like reinventing the HPRB process. We need something that doesn't say in keeping with the historic aspects of having that, because nobody knows what that means. Right. I mean, that's why we're here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We need a little bit more detail that when developers come, they, they, they have a, a clear, concise picture of what's allowed. I'll go no, back to no, what I said before. I think we, we should put in the ordinance what we think we need in the ordinance. And if the Planning Commission staff and the Planning Commission want to develop guidelines consistent with the ordinance, then um, based on their experience, uh, then I think that's fine. Uh, but I think we need to have, I, I don't want to leave a zoning ordinance up to the Planning Commission, is my opinion. You're saying we could have some maybe some recommended guidelines by staff to get to help guide the planning commission. Yes. But it wouldn't be official and legal. Okay. That's not unusual. No, no, I understand that. Okay. But it wouldn't be. Nope. This is what it says. We have I to go by. We this. need yeah. to adopt what we think we need to into the zone into the zoning ordinance. Yeah, I, I, I agree with Jimmy. I don't think we want to get off into having uh, design guidelines that are that big, like no, Smithfields. It's crazy the detail that's in there. And the, and the, it's so restrictive. It's super restrictive. But we could take these guidelines, expand upon them, and have staff use it as a tool for the plan commission. And if that's what you mean, then I'm comfortable with that. There are some wrong ways to do this. That's what we got down but there. Yeah. Or any of them right ways to do it. Also. Yes, sir. But ultimately, we're going back to the ordinance. What is, what is the best right is, way to do it? Yeah. The ordinance is the key. Okay, what do you what do you guys want? Do you want to delay this any further, or do you want to make a decision today? Well, I think procedurally, planning commission is just asking for some feedback. Yeah, asking, yeah I know, but we, we need to tell them what feedback. Yeah. Mm -hmm. do, do you want the guidelines separate, or do you want them in the ordinance? That's the only question we've got left. Is that all? Uh, or or, or that the roads, the streets have come up. We've we've gotten feedback on the streets. Right. Um, you know, in the map, yeah, yeah, we've got that. We've yeah. got that issue, so. Yeah, yeah. No, I would leave them in there, like you said, and, mm -hmm. and we'll ride that for a while and see what okay. happens. That's a consensus. Okay. okay. So you've got what you need. Yes, sir. Thank you all so much. Yeah. Yeah. And, 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 and when we bring it back to the Planning Commission, if there's further discussion that happens, we do have a, uh, a public hearing set up at the next regular meeting. But in the event that we can still conduct that public hearing, in the event we need to table it and bring it back, okay, we can still do that, but we have at least scheduled it so we would be ready to adopt it if it was ready to adopt. Am I right on that? Okay. Yes, okay. Thank, you. Thank you, Jason. Uh, discussion regarding right away dedication from Range Spring Road, Matt Bowen. Well, I hope this is going uh, to be a little simpler than the first items on the agenda. This is, uh, again, this is just uh, informational, just to give you, just to give you a heads up of what's going to be coming to you at one of your upcoming council meetings. When the town started on our Greenspring Road project, uh, the town acquired all the property to build the road. Not only did we acquire property where the road is, we acquired property that, that included uh, temporary areas for construction, stormwater areas where we need to build some detention ponds. Now that the project's finished, we need to clarify what of our property needs to be actually dedicated as street right away. So we're putting a plan together that's going to dedicate, we're going to dedicate town-owned property and, and reclassify it as street right away. Uh, we have to do this because we have to turn the street into VDOT. They want to know how wide the right away is to qualify for our maintenance payments. If it's just a town parcel, we won't get the money for VDOT. We have to clarify what is the street and what is um, town property. So there's a difference between town owned property and, and right of way. We want to switch this over from town owned property to a street right of way. So there's a plat, it'll be on one of your upcoming agendas, and that should be pretty straightforward when it gets to you. If you have any questions, I'll certainly be able to answer yeah, I got I got one question uh, myself that just came to mind, and I want, I want to be sure I get it out. So we, when I was on council or earlier, in, when I was a mayor and I was on council, there was something called covenants that came before the council. This needs to be coordinated. Make sure this is coordinated with these covenants. I don't know what references to right away there are in the covenants, but it had to do with retention basins and access to retention basins and and all of that. Are you aware of that? I'm, I'm not seeing it called a covenant, but I am aware of the agreements of how the maintenance 
the detention spaces are retained. Well, they and have access. Covenants, and I, I agree with you. That's an agreement. But that's what they call. It. Yeah, they call it. They put it all in one agreement. Yeah, yeah. So. yeah. But uh, as long as these are coordinated, uh, that's fine. I just want to make sure. That yeah, I think it's coordinated. I think we'll. Okay. You're talking about the agreement between the town and Marathon. Yes. Should have should not have an impact on that. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Well, got a three sentence sure. title. It is it's just basically laying out the roadway. Yeah, so it is, it, you're talking. Here's the road. Here's the here's the property that we because this is all property that we own. Well, yeah, we're, we're all parcels. We bought them. So right now it's town property. Okay. So it's like going to the Coombe Center. It just has a street on. We want to make sure it's street right away, not all right. All right. town property. All right. I'm okay. And there'll be a forthcoming plat that you'll be able to review. Yeah, I was going to say. Do we yeah, we'll, 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 we know you like maps and plats. No, we, this is just sort of like a precursor to let you know it's coming. And so if we... Um, preview coming attraction. Preview coming attraction. It's like a trailer. And we weren't certain if we were going to have it ready. I mean, we put it on the agenda. Actually, we put it on the agenda like a month ago, and it kind of snuck up on us. And we weren't sure if Tyler was ready to, if the plats were ready yet. So we at least wanted to let you know it was, it was forthcoming. It's not time sensitive, but it's on the horizon. Right. And thank you for that. And, and with all due respect, it's just my tools that yeah. I have to use too. So thank you. No, and when we do the ordinance, there will be a plat. Right. I mean, there will be a plat that shows with the right of ways. You'll be able to see the whole uh, picture. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you, ma'am. You're welcome. Have a good day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, the next item on the agenda is a motion to refer the town center of Abingdon LLC's proposed zoning text amendment to the Planning Commission. Cameron Bell. That's your name, your camera bell. <laughs> <laughs> um, we just got an email uh, from a representative of Town Center of Abingdon LLC that um, because the county has asked for uh, the zoning administrator to uh, make a determination of the definitions in B2, he, his email says that this should be tabled. Um, I'm not sure there is such a thing. I, I, I think we should probably deem it withdrawn and not take any action on it today based on the email but the, the gist of it he says in the email that wasn't to me um, that uh, in light in light of the county's request to uh, to seek the zoning clarification or the zoning determination uh, on some language in the zoning code that they wanted to table the uh, the application for the text amendments and therefore delay the public hearing it says our, our text amendment application was simply to clarify that that specific use, meaning courthouse, and is not and is not required as we also feel the B2 zoning currently conforms and is appropriate. I'll explain what he means in a second. Due to the fact that due to that fact and said zoning determination request, we formally request that the text amendment application be tabled until further notice and not included on the August. We don't have the authority to table or so that's what, I, I, I think we deem it uh, withdrawn and, and take no action. I, I don't agree. Okay. Uh, I don't I think it needs to go to the planning commission uh, unless they withdraw it. That's mm -hmm. we, we we I have a discussion with Jason. We we believe that the safer approach is to have them. We don't have the authority to table. That's what I'm saying. What would you not saying, yeah. would you not deem his request to table it be be a that he's withdrawn it? Not unless he deems to yeah. tell us he's withdrawn. Yes, sir. And let me ask you this: in light of that, and without having that communication that's saying it's being withdrawn, should the planning commission still, or should the council still take action to refer that to the planning commission? And then, yes. once that has been withdrawn, then we could just inform the planning commission. That. I think yes. we should refer okay. to the planning commission. That's my opinion. I've got a question. Who did they send? Who, I, I'm assuming Mr. Barry sent this, right? Uh, and actually, Spangler sent oh, it to. He was the applicant for the and zoning text amendment. Sent it to, sent it to Jason, it to? and he copied me. Mr. Boswell. Mr. So Mr. Boswell. Mr. Spangler sent it to Mr. Boswell. Correct. And Mr. Boswell copied, and I'm, that's only yeah. for a record. I'm not that right. Yeah, we will. We will. I'll make sure I forward that email. He, we he got copied me during. We got it during the meeting, so yeah. that's why we're. That's fine. Uh, if screen. the planning commission wants to table it, they can table it. But I think we should refer the matter to the yeah. planning commission. That's my opinion. Are you okay with that? Yeah. Right, what do you think? Yeah, I think that I think that's the proper approach. I would make the motion that we refer the matter to the planning commission. Okay. Motion by Mr. Bradley. And I'll second that. To refer it to the planning commission. Refer it to the planning commission. Yes. Second by Ms. Patterson. Uh, any discussion? Um, 
I think, considering I'll have to disclose that I do have a personal interest in that transaction, of course, um, pursuant to Code of Virginia, Section 2.2-3112A1, I disqualify myself from participating in Agenda Item B4, Motion to refer the Town Center of Abingdon LLC's proposed zoning text amendment to the Planning Commission. I am employed as well as my wife with KVAT Food Stores Incorporated um, at One Food City Circle Avenue, Virginia, which is an affiliated company of the applicant, and our salaries derived from said employment may reasonably be expected to exceed our customers. Um, update they withdrawn. They withdrawn. They withdrawn. They withdrawn. Then I guess that doesn't make any difference. Hey, you said that well, but they have withdrawn the request for it. Thank you very much. I just want to see if you can read it. It's in writing. We have it. Well, I guess. Uh, and they would draw, you have to withdraw the motion. That has already been advertised as a public hearing. Yeah, and they paid for the public. Yeah, they paid for the publication. So the planning commission needs to have a public hearing, um, regardless of whether the the applicant still wants it. Uh, well, let me make a, a procedural uh, and uh, suggestion and, and Jason, uh, I mean, uh, Cam, you tell me if I'm wrong. I mean, I'm usually wrong. But I, I think uh, in light of this change, I would suggest that you withdraw your motion, we withdraw the second and start all over again. Uh, that would be my suggestion. It happened so quickly. I don't know. I, they're not even in this meeting. That's what I'm, I'm kind what of I'm concerned right? about. They're not even here. What, what I'm but, so, but, but wait, the, the, they have advertised that the planning commission is going to have a public hearing. We can cancel the public hearing. It happens all the time. I, I'm not talking about a public hearing. Your motion is but to in refer. In order for the planning commission to have a public hearing, don't we need to refer it to? Can be help us out here. No, but the public hearing would just be canceled. Jimmy says, you know. That happens all the time. I think they still need to have a public hearing since it was air time. No, we just cancel it. I mean, it would be no different than, I mean, it's, it's not like we're depriving the public of anything. If the, if the applicant has withdrawn, they don't want it considered. So therefore, we have it in writing. It's like before. setting a jury trial and then the case settles yeah. or it's non-suited ahead of time. We just cancel the trial. I mean, it would be on the agenda that we would put on the agenda that the public hearing would been, have been canceled, that we posted on the agenda. Yeah. Um. I, I, I think at the moment the application has been withdrawn, therefore there's nothing for council to act on. Draw my motion, but I don't like it. <laughs> I don't either. I don't, I don't know. Uh, I, I don't like. Uh, I, I'll just say this. I don't. I don't like the way uh, this is being handled by the county. I'll say that publicly. Uh, we are in a constant state of confusion. Uh, they have. Uh, they have consistently changed their requests, and it, I find it to be very confusing and really unnecessary. Uh, I'll say that publicly, but I agree with Cam that, that we can't refer a matter that's been withdrawn. Uh, I mean, I'm going to let you speak. Uh, that's totally out of order, but uh, out of respect I, I, to I would appreciate an attorney, that much, I'll, I'll, if you'll be brief, I'll let you know. We have three minutes. He's got three minutes. Right, uh, that's 20. Less than that. But what I understood, there was a motion made, a second. Um, Mr. Webb, I think, rightly withdrew this or anything I think concerning this matter he should continue recusing himself um, I think that's the right one all right Emma I'm the lawyer you get to your point all right <laughs> <laughs> I'm not there so. <laughs> any event um, I don't know for conducting business I mean we come here this is a notify people to notice this is a public meeting the press is here other members of the public is here and now we're having people just coming in by texting and say, well, we do this. How do we know even this is a person? I, I suspect that uh, this is public legitimate. But are we now starting to conduct business and comments by whoever's texting? The no, town the, town, the town got an email, got two emails. 
Uh, so well, all right, I'm, I'm going to stop it right there. That's, that, that, that's as far as it's going, Emmett. He's our attorney. So. I think you interrupted the mayor saying that it wasn't the way to conduct business. Uh, yeah. The uh, I, I want to raise, I want to know what Jason uh, thinks about uh, this request that that's been made of him and uh, what he needs, uh, what he might need from the Planning Commission, and maybe we should uh, proceed in that in that fashion. Uh, do you think you need any advice from the town, uh, from the uh, from the Planning Commission to respond to this request? I don't think so. I think once an applicant withdraws, it's, 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 it's okay. I mean, you're talking or, about I think I think he's referring to the letter is what he's referring to. Are you talking to. about the town center's application to amend the zoning ordinance or you're talking about the county's letter seeking I, I, a zoning You said in light of the letter, I assume that's the letter you were talking about. They have withdrawn. No. Oh, okay. Who the, withdrew then? Could you please put this on the table? Town Center of Abingdon LLC um, applied for a text amendment to the zoning ordinance. And that's what is on the agenda number four for today. Uh, yes, right. uh, Jason Boswell and Mr. Perani received an email, uh, I believe during the meeting, uh, requesting that from a representative of Town Center of Abingdon LLC to table that application. Th that's the letter you're talking about? You're not talking yeah, about he, the letter he meant, Hold on. Hold on. I'll, 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 that, the email from Town Center of Abingdon referred to a letter. So hold on. That's what you're talking about. Yeah, We're talking okay. about two yeah. separate things. Yeah. Um, it said tabled. We had a discussion uh, under our breath about what tabled meant. And I asked you, and during the interim, Jason sent an email to the representative of Town Center and asked him if he meant it was withdrawn. That representative responded by email to Mr. Boswell saying it is withdrawn. So that's as to the application of Town Center of Abingdon LLC. I have to well, interject. I have sure. not sent that email yet. So. That, well, I think we got a response. Because we were talking must, about you it. Must, you must have. Because we were discussing it. So more than likely, they're watching it on YouTube. Oh, he said it's withdrawn. Okay. Yes. But there you go. I did receive. I did receive an email saying that it is. He would like to withdraw. Okay. I need to say this. Well, hold on. Let me finish explaining all all, all this okay. part. Okay. Yeah, I guess he's watching. Mr. Spangler's watching on YouTube, and he, he anticipated our questions, and he sent another email saying it's not tabled. It is withdrawn. So it is formally by an email to the town that this application from town center is withdrawn okay what that original email from town center was referring to is a separate letter from washington county that asks the zoning administrator to make a determination whether public offices as defined as a permitted use in b2 includes court apps. so that was the question that you were asking yes Jason, that's what i'm asking is is about that letter but that's not on the agenda no we can take it up under matters not on the agenda if we yes, want to. Okay. Uh, Just to clarify, there, those are two okay. separate things. You don't want to confuse them. May, may I ask something or say something? I need to say something. Go ahead. Um, first of all, I know the town council has to be in presence mm -hmm. in, a, in a meeting. We have to be in the meeting. We can't, unless we make other arrangements, we've got to be in the meeting. And I would suggest that any of this, this controversy or confusion should be pushed aside right now because the person is not here that is supposed to be here. If they were interested, which they are, I guess, they should be here. They should be speaking. I don't I don't know that we need that it's legal that we take this text and back and forth in it's a, not a meeting. Text. It's, an, it's an email. Well they can an submit email. applications though via via Well they can electronic. but they're not here. I mean how can we No but the application comes to staff. It's it's the staff. It's, 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 it's the staff. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. okay. It's the staff. Yeah. All right. Thank you for clarifying. That's okay. I just want to make sure we're doing this. No, right. no, no. It's not. It's 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 basically it becomes an administrative matter. Mm -hmm. The application was submitted to staff. We, after consulting with with legal counsel, determined it's best to have uh, the town council refer that matter to the planning commission. Even though the application has been filed, the applicant has now since withdrawn it, and therefore 
Cam's point, there's no need to refer that to the planning commission. I just want to make sure we have all those. No, we, Nobody forgets a step. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yes. Okay. Moving on. Uh, unfinished business consideration. Well, he did make a, a motion to withdraw the motion. He withdrew his motion, and I, I don't guess we have the second. Do you agree? Withdraw your motion. Yes. I'll withdraw mine then. You withdraw your second. Does that does that suffice for? All right, the next item on the agenda is consideration of bids for one. Is it legally sufficiently confused? We're good. All good. All good. Yes, sir. Consideration of bids. Uh, you know, I don't want to read all that stuff. This is a dump truck. So <laughs> <laughs> dump truck. Does it do any better on this item? <laughs> Please, please. After that one, she's like, oh, I got this one. This is a piece of cake. <laughs> <laughs> please, <laughs> please, yes, you, know, it's it's you got your muffins ready. It is consideration of uh, the bid for a new 2020 Kenworth T370 chassis with a Reynolds 12 foot dump body truck for the sewer collections department. I know there was um, some confusion um, at the council meeting on how whether there was an actual written, I guess, list of parameters or whatever that we sent out, or if it was just, you know, phone calls that were made to the individual, um, you know, vendors, you know, to obtain the trucks. Phone calls were made. Um, basically, we um, asked for their standard truck stock equipment. Uh, uh, let me stop you. Uh, Kim can't hear you for some reason. Uh, can you speak louder? Or? You can't hear me. Oh, is it there? Can you see it? Yeah. <laughs> Somebody turned it on. Well, what do we need to do? It's different. Hey, uh, Emmett. Will you and uh, Joe go outside and talk? Uh, Kim can't hear. The microphones are so sensitive, I can't hear anything. Be happy to. Sorry. <laughs> How long, what is the cutoff date on the emails? <laughs> we'll talk, stop looking we'll talk in the alley later on. <laughs> no, we won't do it with email. <laughs> just don't want to watch the official cutoff date. Right, thank you. Thank, thank you. you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Emmett. Thank you. I'm sorry, sir. Oh, it's all right. Okay, I'll start. Okay. I am here. Um, well, thank you for having me. <laughs> I'm here for your consideration um, for the purchase of a new 2020 Kenworth T370 dump truck uh, for the Sewer Collections Department. Um, this was on the Council's agenda and I understand that it was actually moved to the work session because there was um, a question on how the, I guess, the proposals were obtain whether a list of parameters were sent to each vendor or if just separate phone calls were made requesting actual quotes be sent in and phone calls were made to these individual companies um, he requested basically their stock truck no add-ons no special equipment or anything was um, requested in order to keep the cost down we received um, three three bids and the one that we um, have requested for purchase is actually not the lowest, but the second lowest. It's 93,311. Um, we feel that this is a better truck um, for the sewer collections department. When looking at the individual parameters, it has a larger horsepower engine. Um, it has a larger, uh, it has a 12 foot, um, dump gate versus a 10 foot which is on the other two trucks that means there's a little more hauling capacity uh, we feel like this is a much better truck uh, for the department and worth the additional less than three thousand dollar difference so I'm, I'm open for questions the, the only issue that i had was it had been described as a request for proposals which it, that's not what happened what sarita right. said it was just it, the solicitation. They, they yeah. called some yeah. people. It's under the limit for the procurement act, so it's it's fine. I, with that clarification, 
it's, it's good. The, we have the bid in writing, I think mm -hmm. I've seen it. It was in the last packet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. okay. Is a motion in order here? Yes. Um, we need to talk I about the financing. We did last time. I know. All Let's right. get to the <laughs> <laughs> transparency. I, will, I do want to go with the lowest bidder on this, and it's 2.75% for First Bank and Trust. Uh, those will be uh, annual payments with semi-annual uh, interest payments uh, for for this purchase. It, they were the lowest of the five uh, quotes that I got. All right, Al. You want to make your motion? Now? I'll do. We we accept uh, Serena's recommendation on the buying the truck and uh, Chuck's recommendation on finance. Okay, motion by Mr. Bradley to accept uh, Sarita's uh, recommendation on the dump truck and Chuck's recommendation on the financing. Is there a second? I'll second that. They only got there first. <laughs> second by Ms. Quetch. Go on, withdraw your apple, uh, withdraw your Please don't. I got horses to feed. <laughs> I'll tell you, guys, uh, check your email first. Jimmy, uh, we don't need to make this decision in one day. Uh, uh, in discussion. Okay, Kim call roll, please. Mr. Bradley. Aye. Ms. Quetch. Aye. Mr. Webb. Aye. Ms. Patterson. Aye. Mayor Craig. Aye. Thank you very much. Okay, the next item on the agenda is a closed session. Uh, I think we've got a motion on that. Yes. <coughs> Do you want to talk to Jason about this letter? That's, uh, you, you're keeping me on to be to the agenda. That's matters not on the agenda. It's not. It's not next. It's after the closed session. Gotcha. Uh, if you want to, uh, if the council want to move that, uh, if we are right to move that, and I'll bring that up. Uh, is it okay? Okay. We'll take up matters on, not on the agenda now. Jason. Yes, sir. What I would like to know. This uh, seems like to put a, a big burden on you. Uh, Surely not. Uh, uh, and it's a big decision you have to make. Uh, do you need it? Is there anything we can do to help? Do you need any advice? Do you need public input? Do you need uh, input from the Planning Commission? Uh, 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 or do you want to wait and tell us later? Or? Yeah, I, I, would, I would prefer to wait and discuss with Cam and okay. Jimmy. Before we move forward. Okay. Okay. All right. Would that be okay, right. everybody? Thank you, Jason. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Okay, so we'll take up the closed session now. Well, Cindy? Yes, sir. Did we already make the motion, make Mr. Mayor? Did the, was the motion already made for closed no, session? No, okay. Yet. I wanted to add the, um, for contracts. I don't know if you, okay. Okay. All right. So there's two, two matters. Yeah, we got. Yes, I got it. You ready to go? Okay, I move that the having the town council convene in closed session to discuss the following. As permitted by Virginia Code 2.2-3711A29 uh, for discussion of the terms or scope of the contract because public discussion would adversely affect our bargaining position or negotiating strategy. And as permitted by Virginia Code 2.2-3711A8 a matter involving specific legal matter requiring the advice of counsel. Um, it's two, two, the two items that we have to go into a closed session on. Okay. Motion by Ms. Powell to go into closed session. Is there a second? I'll second. Second by Ms. Quetch. Any discussion? Kim Caldwell, please. Mr. Bradley. Aye. Ms. Quetch. Aye. Mr. Webb. Aye. Ms. Patterson. Aye. Mr. Webb. Aye.
Hey, we're his radio station. Oh, are you working in the radio station? Yeah. Like a disc jockey? Do you want to do a show for him? You do. Do you do? Do you do? Do they pay you for that or is it like a guest hall? A public radio. That page? Not just that. No, just a mention. 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 We have our radio station. We're ready to go. All right, is there a motion we go back into open session? So moved. Motion by uh, Mr. Webb is there a second? Second. Second by Mr. Bradley. Any discussion? Kim Carl, please. Mr. Bradley. Aye. Ms. Quetch. Aye. Mr. Webb. Aye. Ms. Patterson. Aye. Mayor Craig. Aye. Okay, can it soon you do whatever sure. you want to do there? Sure. I move that the town council certify that in the closed session just concluded, nothing was discussed except the matters or matters, matter or matters specifically identified in the motion to convene in closed session and number two lawfully permitted to be discussed under the provisions of the Virginia Freedom of Information Act cited in that motion. Mr. Bradley. I so certify. Ms. Quetch. I so certify. Mr. Webb. I so certify. Ms. Patterson. I so certify. And Mayor Craig. I so certify. Okay, one more uh, matter of council member reports. Derek, do you have a report? Not today. Donna? Not today. Sandy? Not today. None. Okay. Mr. Mayor, I, I do have a report. Okay. You had asked me earlier to say something. You're not a council member. Well, go ahead. <laughs> um, two things I just wanted to bring up, just informational purposes only. Number one, I'm working uh, with the Masonic Lodge. We apparently had an agreement a, a long time ago or a while ago. I know Kim remembers it. We At one time we had one or it's still in effect. Um, but we need to renew this. It is a agreement for a ladle that we have being um, exhibited at the uh, the muster grounds, and it just states. And I'm going to have Cam look at this. It's just a pretty simple two and a half agreement that says that we're just responsible for it while we have it. It's being displayed. It's been secured and everything. So I just want to let, let you be aware of it. Here's a photo of it if you haven't seen it. It's a ladle. I'll, I'll give the background after the meeting. We've already been here long enough, but um, it belonged to George Washington at one time, and he gave it to. So everybody probably knows about it. Then. <laughs> Anyhow, so um, there's just an agreement. Just kind of taps on loose ends. That I'll sign it once once uh, it came and had a chance to review it. Uh, we just have to insure, make sure it's insured, basically. All the, uh, for informational purposes only. Also, uh, I just wanted to bring your attention. There is a an initiative um, for a um, it's a group uh, to Virginia's Great Valley Lewis and Clark Eastern Legacy Trail, and it's part of the VGV LCELT project. And what it is is just bringing awareness to, I guess, the eastern portion of the Lewis and Clark Trail. There's a group of, of state um, uh, interested people who are putting this together and trying to raise awareness. Um, and there's a grassroots group. And I just have a presentation that as soon as I get that, I'll forward it to you. It just it could be some additional. Um, there's no money that we're paying it right now. It's all you know, nonprofit. So I just wanted to bring it to your attention. I was asked to uh, to bring that up. And when I get this slide electronically, I'd ask for it. I'll forward it to you. Uh, Jimmy, I want to remind you something while the council stood here. Sure. We, we need to do a capital improvements program, mm -hmm. and uh, you were getting some advice from the me. The, yeah, me and uh, we need to schedule our retreat. Retreat, right? Uh, so will you coordinate with Kim? Yes, okay. he will remind me to do that. Why, right, Kim? One thing I think we yeah. decided earlier is that they pull those capital improvements and put them by themselves, pull them out. Has that ever been done? You mean in the, like you have a separate budget for yeah, capital so projects? Capital. I think that's what. Yeah, I can have that. Yeah. So we can actually identify. Yeah. So when we have that retreat, we can say, here are all the capital yeah. projects that we budgeted. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Will you be part. our linger on our retreat? Yeah. What's that? Will you yeah. be our linger on the retreat? I can, but if you want me to. I thought I was going to do that soon. I mean, he, you know, I don't, yeah, I don't want to steal the mayor's thunder. Hey, I think when you get to one of those, I mean, let's call it a facilitator. <laughs> That's what you usually do with those. You have somebody facilitate discussion because everybody's going to have a discussion. Yes, thank you all for reading. Are you saying that we're adjourned? We're adjourned. Thank you. Thanks. All right. Just see where we're going.